Hey guys, welcome back. It's uh, time for lesson 31. We're going to continue our investigation of scattering because we're moving our way toward nuclear reactions. And in order to understand those, we need to understand how we get data about nuclear phenomena. And mostly that data comes in the form of scattering experiments. Okay, so let's see what you remember from last time. You know that we were talking about uh, incoming waves that we treated as plane waves, and then the outgoing waves were basically the consequence of scattering of the plane waves, and they uh, went like e to the ikr over r with a theta dependence. But we broke the incoming wave down into angular momentum components, and thereby also broke the outgoing wave into angular momentum components, and we ended up with an expression for the scattering amplitude in terms of its angular momentum pieces. And it's basically a kind of a uh, series expansion with the expansion coefficients called the partial wave amplitudes, or the A sub Ls. Now these are complex numbers in general that tell how much uh, you've got of each angular momentum component in the outgoing scattered part of the wave function. It turns out because of the fact that in many contexts the potential is spherically symmetric, uh, we know that the probability doesn't switch from one angular momentum component to another. In other words, because the uh, potential energy is uh, spherically symmetric, it can't produce a torque. So we'll, we'll see how that goes in a minute. Um, right now I want to remind you of a few things. You guys remember, of course, the Euler relation between e to the i x and cosine and sine, e to the minus i x and cosine and sine. I want to point out that there's a very similar relationship between the spherical Bessel functions of the first and second kind, the j's and the n's, and the Henkel functions of the first and second kind, the h1 and h2 functions. They have a very similar relationship. You know that if you believe in the uh, Euler relation, you can reverse it and write cosine as a superposition of e to the i x and e to the minus i x. And you can write sine similarly as a superposition of those two guys. Somewhat analogously, you can write the uh, Bessel function of the first kind, the j, as a superposition of the first and second type of Henkel function, and also the n's you can write as a superposition of Henkel functions. Um, and so I just want you to kind of, when you're looking at these crazy looking expressions and so on and trying to figure out what it all means, you might bear in mind this sort of relationship to something more familiar, and that might help you to understand kind of what's going on. Okay, so back to the monstrosity. Here we have the uh, full solution to the Schrodinger equation expressed in terms of these Henkel functions. Then the Henkel functions of the first kind in the asymptotic limit turn out to look like e to the i k r over r. So if we're trying to think of the wave function as a superposition of an incoming plane wave and an outgoing scattered wave, it helps to remember that the Henkel function looks like the outgoing scattered wave. But um, you know that uh, the amplitude, the partial wave amplitude, fits in the same place as the Henkel function. So you, it's the, it's the uh, part of the expression there on the right that uh, has the Henkel function with it. And as I was saying, if the potential is spherically symmetric, then it turns out you can't move probability from one component to another component, the probability has to be the same. What that means is really uh, all that can happen is a change of phase. So how do we see that? So we can we can write the incoming plane wave as a superposition of Bessel functions and uh, remember that the Bessel function is a superposition of the two Henkel functions. So if you put that in and look at what the Henkel functions look like asymptotically at large values of r, the Henkel function looks like an incoming wave and an outgoing wave. The incoming wave is the e to the minus ikr, and the outgoing wave is e to the plus ikr. And what happens as a result of the scattering is because we can't shift probability from one uh, 
angular momentum component to another, it means the only thing that you can do that doesn't change the probability is to change the phase. So if you flip that around and you add a phase shift, that has to be the net effect of the scattering. So notice the incoming wave doesn't change, but the outgoing wave gets a, gets a additional phase. That's kind of the idea. And it gets a two delta because it gets a delta on the way in and a delta on the way out, basically. So it traverses the potential twice, and so we give it a, effectively a two delta. So the idea is we're going to attack the finite square well with this mathematics, this terrible mathematics. And I just want to remind you about the finite square well. Um, first of all, the radial function is r times the wave function. If you make that substitution into the Schrodinger equation, and you look at the L equals zero term, only, only consider L equals zero, then the, the Schrodinger wave equation reduces to what looks like a simple one-dimensional um, problem. With the minor caveat that because of the definition of u, u has to go to zero at the origin. So the, a finite spherical square well basically looks like a square well that has an infinite potential at the origin and a finite potential everywhere else. And because it's square, it means we're going to have a minus v naught inside the well and zero outside the well for a potential. And so you know this differential equation pretty well by now. So you know that in order to satisfy the boundary condition at the origin, the inside wave function has to go like sine. And the outside wave function has no such boundary condition. So it's free to uh, be a little bit of cosine and a little bit of sine. But the wave number inside and outside are different. The wave number inside corresponds to an additional kinetic energy of V0. And outside, it's just the free energy, the kinetic energy, h bar, what is it, whatever, h bar squared, k squared over 2m. So what does this look like? Um, the point is, inside the well, the kinetic energy is a little higher, which means the wavelength's a little shorter. So when you go to match up the uh, amplitude and the slope of the wave function at the boundary, what you find is that the uh, wave function outside looks like it's just a sine plus a cosine, but it's been shifted in phase relative to what it would have been had the potential not been there. If the potential, but the potential hadn't been there, then the wave function would have to go to zero at the origin with a fixed wavelength all the way, the same wavelength all the way to the origin. But because of the potential barrier, or the potential well, rather, the wavelength got a little shorter inside the well, and so the phase of the wave function shifted. So we call that phase shift delta. And in space, of course, it's delta divided by k. That's the difference in position where the wave function would have gone to zero and where it does actually go to zero. And uh, I want to show you a couple demos about how to think about this. So let's break for a demo. OK, so this is a, uh, a square well. This is the wave function that you see here. The blue line is the actual wave function inside and outside the well. The green dots are the what the wave function would be if it weren't for the well being there. Um, and it will illustrate the phase shift. So the idea is uh, right now the well has got zero uh, potential. But if I turn on the well a little bit, you can see that uh, what happens is the wavelength inside the well gets less, and we get this phase shift. So notice the this is considered a positive phase shift, okay? Because um, the the thing is attractive and it's uh, advancing the phase. The phase here is more than it would be if it weren't if the well weren't there. The phase would be less at a given r than it is with the well there. And notice that. Um, Let's see, if the phase shift gets to be big enough, uh, as, the, as the well gets deeper, the phase shift just continues to get larger, more greater and greater phase shift, till we get to something like that. Okay, and it, we, we just keep going. So uh, one thing I want to point out is that the phase shift is a monotonically increasing function of the well depth for an attractive well. As the well gets deeper, you get greater and greater amounts of phase shift for uh, a given wave function. And this is, of course, this is all L equals zero. Notice we got L equals zero here. Um, and that's why we're getting away with sines and cosines. If we 
want to go to L equals 1 or L equals 2, then these have to change, and they're going to be something like, you know, Bessel functions times R or some crazy thing. But, uh, but it's easy to see what's going on in the L equals 0 case. As the well gets deeper, you get a greater and greater phase shift. Okay, this is the same idea. The difference is now the, the energy of the wave function outside the well, the energy of the particle outside the well, is very low. So you'll notice that it, the curvature of the wave function is very tiny, if, if anything. It, all, it looks like a straight line, practically. Um, so this is the low energy version of the same thing. And in the low energy case, because this is uh, basically a straight line, the distance here is called the distance from the origin to the point where the wave function would cross the axis, or at least it asymptotically appears, the asymptote appears to cross the axis here. This is called the scattering length. And it turns out the scattering length is related to the cross section, which, uh, uh, how's the short story go? If, if we have a, this is a, a positive scattering length, and that's a negative scattering length. But in the positive scattering length case, you can see the scattering length is the radius of a hard sphere potential, an infinite potential that would give the same uh, cross section. In other words, if, if instead of having a soft potential here with a finite well depth, if I had an infinite barrier right here at the scattering length, then the wave function would go to zero there, and it would appear to be just like a hard sphere of radius uh, equal to the scattering length, the distance between the origin and the place where this wave function crosses. So you can see the scattering length is related to the effective uh, cross-section of the potential for low energy incoming particles. So that's what the scattering length is about. And we're going to find out that uh, when we talk about the deuteron, we'll find out that the scattering length is a very useful idea for estimating the cross-section of the of a deuteron, for example, uh, of neutrons scattering off of protons. Um, okay, so here's the thing. If I increase the well depth, this thing goes through various changes. And notice the scattering length uh, changes a lot depending on exactly uh, how deep the well is. So as a function of well depth, the scattering length varies a lot. We're going to find out. In fact, the cross section the total cross-section turns out to be 4 pi times the scattering length squared. If you remember from Griffiths, the total cross-section of a hard sphere at low energy turned out to be nothing other than 4 pi times the radius of the hard sphere squared. The scattering length plays the same role as the radius of that hard sphere, and so the hard sphere model is actually useful. It tells us the low energy um, cross-section of basically any potential, because any potential is going to have a scattering length at low energies. Because when you get outside the potential, the wave function is a straight line, and you can identify a distance that's the scattering length. So that's the way that works. Next, when you guys are in class today, I'm just going to let you have a peek at the board work. What I want you to do is to basically use this solution inside and outside the well. Um, notice that you can rewrite the solution outside the well as a, as a phase-shifted sine function, and you can see that the phase angle is uh, related to the sine and cosine coefficients from the original expression. So if you can figure out what b and c are, or you can figure out their ratio, then you can work out the phase shift. So what I wanna, I'm going to give you some real numbers and see if we can't work out the phase shift for uh, low energy neutrons colliding with protons using a square, spherical square well model potential. And uh, so we'll do that in class. But uh, let's work backwards now. Let's relate that to the uh, scattering amplitude. Obviously, somehow this must relate back to the scattering amplitude since that's what you can physically measure. And so I want to uh, remind you about the scattering amplitude and how it looks and the wave function and how it looks. What I'd like to do is just focus on L equals zero for the moment. It turns out for neutrons on protons, a lot of the interesting data that you can actually interpret is for low energy, uh, less than 10 MeV, say, and, uh, 
and in that domain, only L equals zero is really important. So let's go ahead and just look at what happens, and also it's simpler. And L equals zero, the U function just turns out to be the sine, and um, that's just e to the plus i k r plus e to the minus i k r. It's equal parts of incoming and outgoing uh, spherical wave fronts. But uh, if the if you turn on the potential, then this gets shifted to an e to the i k r plus two delta. But I want to monkey with that a little bit. Let's look at that expression. That's the full wave function. But I can add and subtract e to the i k r to the numerator. And then notice that uh, if I rearrange things, I've got uh, a sine of k r. And then I can factor out the e to the i k r from the other part. And I end up with this e to the i k r. And then I have an e to the i 2 delta minus 1 over 2i. But I can factor an e to the i delta out of that. And uh, notice I've got a sine of delta times e to the i delta times e to the i k r. Well, e to the i k r was the original outgoing wavefront. Uh, e to the i delta times sine delta, that's starting to look like my, uh, like my scattering amplitude. And uh, if you go back and look at the original expression for scattering amplitude, you'll see that what it actually turns out to be the partial amplitude is uh, e to the i k delta, e to the i delta sine delta over k. And uh, now I've only worked it out for l equals zero. It turns out shockingly that it you get the same exact result for all values of l. Although uh, if you're interested, you can pursue that. There's places on the internet that show how that works, but it, it's basically the same manipulation I just did except using the generic Bessel functions instead of the sine and cosine. But uh, anyway, that's the answer. So it turns out that uh, these partial scattering amplitudes are really uh, due to a, a simple uh, single number, a real number, the phase shift. And the phase shift is useful in situations where probability is being conserved, it, it's just getting shifted. The amplitude of the wave function is just shifting in phase. And uh, if I put that back into the expression I had for the scattering amplitude, you can see how to, once you know the phase shifts, you can calculate the scattering amplitude. And uh, if you integrate over all angles, you can even calculate the total scattering cross-section. If you uh, Let's go ahead and work this out. I went ahead and worked it out for the square well for a couple of different potentials. Here's, uh, here's for one potential that's fairly weak. In this case, it turns out the uh, you can see the strongest cross-section is L equals 0. But if you go up, and now that's k in the denominator. And you know energy goes like k squared. So uh, if you square this, the, the uh, functions that start at 0 are going to flatten out a little bit. But uh, you can see that the dominant term is the L equals 0 term. If I bump up the size of the potential a little bit and graph that as a function of k, an interesting thing happens. You notice that the L equals 0 phase shift starts out instead of at 0, it starts out at pi. And that turns out to be significant. We're going to see in a little bit that, and in fact you may have noticed from the earlier demo, that uh, when the phase shift starts out at pi, even though the energy is going to zero, it means that you already had a bound state. In other words, there's enough, the potential well is deep enough and wide enough to have at least one bound state for L equals zero. In fact, it has exactly one bound state. If I make the potential even deeper, here's a 12.1 potential. The, uh, you'll notice that the uh, L equals zero phase starts at 2 pi now. L equals 1 and L equal 2 start at pi, and all the higher ones start at 0. So the interpretation there is that even if you go down to 0 energy, you get a phase shift. That means that you have two bound states in the L equals 0 case, and one bound state in the L equal 1 and L equal 2 state. So I guess the important insight to get from this is that um, you can discover things about the ability of the potential to uh, hold particles in bound states based on the phase shift that you see 
from a scattering experiment. Notice no binding has actually occurred here. This is scattering we're looking at, but it's scattering that shows us um, something about the internal structure capabilities, I guess, of the of the well. So uh, let's go ahead and look at some more demos and discuss the low energy phase shifts and this idea of the scattering length. Okay, so here's a similar setup. I have the wave function up here. I'm going to vary the well depth, but I'm graphing here the phase shift and the cross section at the same time as a function of this of the well depth. Basically, this is a scaled version of well depth here. It's the square root of the well depth times the the uh, times the size of the well. This actually works out to be th the phase of the wave function inside the well as it meets the boundary. So let's see what happens. If I start increasing the well depth, notice um, I start to get a scattering length and the phase difference starts out pretty much zero. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and crank up the well depth here, but notice that the scattering length goes through a maximum right about there. In fact, it goes to infinity very briefly. Uh, at the same time, the phase shifts by pi. The phase goes from zero to pi very quickly. And if you remember, um, basically the scattering length goes like the tangent of the phase difference. And so the phase difference in going from zero to pi, it very quickly passes through pi over two, which is a singularity in the scattering length, which puts a singularity in the cross section. So the cross section goes through a maximum um, and uh, it happens again when the scattering length goes through a maximum here, when the phase goes through another half integer multiple of pi over two, and the cross section again blows up. So you'll see that the you get a series of uh, regions where the phase difference jumps from an integer multiple of pi to the next integer multiple of pi, and in passing through the odd integer multiple of pi over two, the scattering cross section blows up. These things are called resonances, okay? They're called resonances, and uh, they're very important, but uh, that's, that's how they come about. And here's a similar situation, but this time, Instead of varying the well depth, we're going to vary the energy of the particle coming in. And you can see that that changes the phase shift, and changing the phase shift changes the cross section. So again, the main point is that if you can theoretically predict the phase shift by matching boundary conditions at the well, for example, if you want to model it as a finite square well, then you can compute the cross section and you can compare with the experimental results. And here's one last thing. Here is the phase shift as a function of a k, which is like energy. It's the square root of energy for a moderate depth well, where you've got one bound state at low energy. But notice that as you increase the energy, the scattering cross section varies. And almost all the cross section here is in the s l equals 0. So there's basically no cross section for l equals 1, l equals 2, l equals 3. So this would be S wave scattering only. But if you uh, bump up the well depth a little bit, you get a more interesting situation. Here we have a well depth of 32.4 on this scale. And uh, notice that uh, here we have 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi. So there's three bound states in the for the S wave, two bound states for L equals 1 and L equals 2, and uh, one bound state for these guys. It looks like we have here L equals 5, L equals 4, and L equals 3, each of which has one bound state. So it's a much richer uh, situation when the well is a lot deeper. But uh, the other thing I want to point out is here's an example of a resonance. Here is the L equals uh, 6 state is going from uh, 0 phase difference, and very quickly it jumps up to pi, or pretty nearly pi. And when it jumps up, there's a big spike in the cross section for that partial um, wave. And you can see the total cross section this is the sum of all these cross sections. It also gets a bump. 
and that bump is due to the L equals 6 partial wave cross-section at that particular energy. So that's another way to look at a resonance, and uh, we're going to see some more of that in the near future. Okay, and real quick, I just wanted to point out that we can use this math, all this crazy math, to actually build pictures of what the scattering process looks like. This is sort of similar to the things I did in, in vPython with, in three dimensions, but it turned out you can get a little more detail if you just do it in two dimensions with contour plots. So that's what I've got here. Um, and also I've calculated, if you remember at the beginning of Griffiths, there was a f expression for the, uh, the probability current, which is, you know, it's something like psi star grad psi minus uh, psi grad psi star, something like that. Anyway, um, if you calculate that thing, you can actually make a, uh, pretty pictures which show the probability current vectors in the, so this is a plane wave, so it, and this is the, I'm actually graphing the real part here, just so you can see the wave structure, and uh, it looks like you'd expect all the probabilities going to the right. But if I, uh, hang on a second, if I switch this to soft sphere, and run it. You should see here, okay, now we're in a soft sphere situation and we got probability going to the right, but what's fun is you can see that in the soft sphere case, the shift in, in the uh, wavelength, it gets shorter wavelength inside the, in the well, and that produces increase in current flow. Probability current gets transferred from this region out here into the center and it looks almost like optics. This looks like a lens of some kind, and we've got waves coming in and being focused. So this is sort of like probability focusing. And uh, you can also do the hard sphere. Let me go ahead and switch this. You can see what the hard sphere looks like. It looks quite different. You got a big shadow region here, and the probability is getting shifted to the outside. So it's kind of fun what you can do with math and you can see the probability currents getting pushed around like, like that. Uh, pretty cool. Anyway, the other thing you can do, of course, is make movies. So I went ahead and made some movies. Uh, this turned out to be quite easy because all you have to do is uh, turn on the e to the minus i omega t. Uh, all the wave functions have the same energy. They have the same omega. They all happen in phase. But, uh, but I think it, it turned out quite nice that uh, you can see the probability uh, piling up in the middle there. Let's go ahead and look at the hard sphere case. Um, there's the hard sphere. You'll notice a lot more reflection interfering with the incoming wave in the hard sphere case. But uh, and then there's that uh, that shadow. But uh, I thought you might find that entertaining. I know I did. And we'll be looking at this some more when we talk about neutron proton nuclear reactions. We we basically have already done the scattering part. We've done the math, but we haven't actually compared it to experiment to see what it all means. We'll, we'll be doing that next time. I'll talk to you soon.